about colligative properties of solutions. Don't be too concerned about the word colligative. It simply means properties that depend on the solution's concentration. So up to this point, we have looked at several different ways of talking about the concentration of a solution. And today, we're going to use molality uh, as the primary um, way to quantify a solution's concentration. So up here, I've got a picture of salt water. Uh, if we could look at the actual molecular scale here, um, we would be seeing that we have uh, sodium, atom, uh, sodium ions that are surrounded by water molecules and chloride ions that are surrounded by water molecules. And when you put sodium chloride in the water, uh, the sodium ions separate from the chloride ions because water has a positive and a negative end. So you get all of the negative ends of the water molecules that are attracted to the sodium atom, and you get the positive ends of the water molecules that are attracted to the chloride ions, and it pulls them apart, which is how they dissolve in solution. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what we saw in the lab the other day. When we added drops of sodium chloride solution, we were looking at the conductivity of the solution, which is a measure of how well it conducts electricity, uh, versus the number of drops of solution that we put in. And we saw that as we increased the number of drops in our solution, meaning that our concentration of the solution went up, then we saw an increase in the conductivity. And it looked like it was linear. And in fact, you guys found a slope. So a solution's conductivity, again, how well it conducts electricity, is a, a property that depends on the concentration. So as concentration goes up, then conductivity also goes up. It's important to note here that not all solutions conduct electricity. Only solutions that, when they dissolve, produce negative and positive ions, like sodium chloride, will conduct electricity. Those solutions that don't have ions in it, like sugar water, uh, will not conduct electricity because sugar is sucrose. Um, it is a molecular compound, and it does not dissolve into ions when it dissolves in water. The molecules remain whole. All right, so let's look at another property that depends on the concentration of a solution. Next up, we're going to take a look at something called vapor pressure. And if you'll remember, vapor pressure is the molecules of evaporated substance that push down on the liquid surface of a substance. Um, and here we have water in two closed containers. And up here on the top, uh, what we can see is that we have a fair number of water molecules that have evaporated, and they are pushing down on the surface of the container. Down here, we have sugar water. We can see that we have some sucrose molecules dissolved in our water. Uh, and what happens here is that the attraction of the water molecules to the sucrose molecules doesn't allow as many water molecules to evaporate from the surface. So what we see up here is a higher vapor pressure. And down below, we see the opposite. We see a lower vapor pressure. And at first glance, think, OK, well, who cares? But what you've got to remember is that the higher the vapor pressure, what we have to remember is the connection of vapor pressure to boiling. Uh, boiling happens when the atmospheric pressure reaches the vapor pressure. And one way to do that is to increase the temperature. We increase the vapor pressure by increasing the temperature until the water boils. The other way to do that is to decrease the atmospheric pressure, like when we saw room temperature water or even ice water boiling when we had it in the vacuum chamber in the classroom. So vapor pressure, to start with, is another colligative property. Uh, the higher the concentration, then we have, or, well, let's say it this way. As concentration increases, then vapor pressure decreases. And that's important when we get to boiling point. So really, we don't care too much about vapor pressure in and of itself. What happens when we add a whole bunch of solute to water is 
it lowers the vapor pressure, so then it's going to actually decrease the boiling point. And actually, I said that wrong. It's going to increase the boiling point because we're going to have to bring the water temperature up higher uh, to get the vapor pressure to match our uh, atmospheric pressure because it has a lower vapor pressure. So we're going to have to increase the temperature of this water right here by more um, to make it boil. Uh, so that's another colligative property. So as concentration increases, boiling point also increases. So you add salt to a pot of water before you make pasta, and you bring that water to a boil. And a lot of people think that by adding salt to it, you're actually decreasing the amount of time it takes to boil, that it's going to boil faster. In fact, the opposite is true. You add salt to that water, and it's going to take longer to boil because you're going to have to get it hotter to boil. So one reason to add salt is for flavoring your pasta. The other reason to add salt to the water is because your water is going to boil at a higher temperature. Your pasta will cook faster. Okay, so here we're going to actually add in an equation to talk about the effect that the change in concentration has on boiling point. So our equation is this. The change in the boiling temperature, delta T sub B, is going to equal the amount of the concentration. And here we're going to use molality as our concentration um, quantifier. Uh, and then also, we're going to multiply this by a constant, K sub B. This is a boiling point constant, and it's specific to the solvent. Um, and then also, we're going to add one more thing. We're going to add in this I, which is something called the Vant Hoff factor. And going back here, what we see is when sucrose dissolves in water, the molecules remain whole. You've got one molecule of sucrose uh, dissolved. So one mole of sucrose dissolved in water makes one mole of sucrose molecules dissolved in water. That totally makes sense. But going back to this screen right here, each mole of sodium chloride has one mole of sodium atoms and one mole of chloride atoms. So when you dissolve one mole of sodium chloride in water, you actually get two moles of dissolved ions in water. This is where the Van Hoff factor comes in. The Van Hoff factor is just a whole number that accounts for the difference here. So one mole of sodium chloride dissolves into two moles of ions. So the Van Hoff factor for sodium chloride is two. Going to sugar, one mole of sucrose dissolves into one mole of sucrose molecules in water. So the Van Hoff factor for sucrose is one. Okay? So let's get our numbers down here and our ideas. So we have K sub B. Um, this is called the molal boiling point constant. Let's just say molal boiling constant. Boiling constant. Uh, and for water, it has a value of 0 0.512. We're only going to be dealing with water solutions. If you had to, you could look up uh, a, boiling, a boiling point constant for ethanol. Uh, and it would be different than that for water. It's actually quite a bit higher than that for water. All right, But for us, we're just going to be plugging in 0.512 for K in here. The M, this is the lovely cursive M. This is the molality. And remember that that is moles of solute divided by kilograms of solvent. So if we're talking about a water solution, it would be moles of solute over kilograms of water. And then I is equal to the Vance Hoff factor. And we'll move on to the next screen so it can be up high. So this I, this Vant Hoff factor, is equal to a whole number. And it's different for different substances. If the substance is molecular, if the solute is molecular, like sucrose, remember molecular substances are generally all nonmetals bonded together. They have covalent bonds. Then I is always equal to 1. 
because when you dissolve a molecular substance in water, the molecules stay whole. So one mole, one mole of the solute is equal to one mole of particles in solution. If the solute is ionic, then I equals the number of ions in the ionic formula. So let's look at a couple examples here. Uh, for NaCl, this dissolves into Na and Cl, chloride. Um, there are two ions in NaCl, so then I equals 2. If we have something like, and we saw this in the lab, something like aluminum chloride, AlCl3, the aluminum chloride, drop for drop, gave us a bigger slope in our conductivity graph, which means that every drop of aluminum chloride increased the conductivity more than every drop of sodium chloride. And the reason for that is that when aluminum chloride dissolves in water, it gives you an aluminum 3 plus ion, and it gives you 3 chloride ions. So we have then a vent Hoff factor equal to the total number of ions in aluminum chloride, and that would be a vent Hoff factor of 4. So again, for molecular solutes, like something like carbon dioxide, um, sugar, alcohol, I is always going to equal 1. For ionic solutes, you have to add up the total number of ions in the formula. Uh, so NaCl gives us a vent Hoff factor of 2. And aluminum chloride gives us a vent Hoff factor of 4. So let's do an example problem. So here's our example problem. We have 40 grams of aluminum chloride dissolved in 200 milliliters of water. What is the new boiling temperature of the solution? The normal boiling temperature of water at standard atmospheric pressure uh, is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. So by adding in the aluminum chloride, we're going to change that. Reminding ourselves again what the equation is, it's change in T is equal to that constant, K sub B, times the molality of the solution, times the vent Hoff factor. Okay, we can get the vent Hoff factor right away. We did it on the previous board. So I for aluminum chloride is equal to 4, because there's three chlorides, one aluminum, when we dissolve it in water. So we know we're going to be putting a 4 in for the I. We also know that K sub B is that 0 0.512 that I gave you on the previous screen. So all that's left now is we do have to find the molality of aluminum chloride. So reminding ourselves that molality, again, is moles of solute divided by kilograms of solvent. First, we have to find the moles of aluminum chloride. So that is 40 grams of AlCl3 times, I just happen to know that one mole of aluminum chloride is 133.5 grams of aluminum chloride, and you would look on your periodic table to confirm that. So we do the math, and we luckily get 0 0.3 moles per kilogram. Uh, sorry, nope, that's 0 0.3 moles. We haven't done the molality yet. Just 0 0.3 moles for the number of moles of our aluminum chloride. So now we've got enough to use the equation. We just plug everything in. The change in the boiling temperature is equal to 0 0.512, that was the constant, times the molality, 0 0.3, times the Van Hoff factor, which would be 4. Throwing that into the calculator. And back up. Actually, just made a total mistake. Uh, I just found the number of moles. I have not found the molality of the solution yet. So I still need to do that part. We've got the number of moles on top. So our molality then is going to be the number of moles, which we just calculated, 0 0.30 divided by the kilograms of solvent, which is 200 milliliters of water, which is 200 grams of water, which is 0 0.2 kilograms of water. You've got to remember that the density of water is 1 gram per milliliter. So now 0 0.3 divided by 0 0.2 gives us 1.5 for our molality. 1.5 moles per kilogram. Okay, whew. now we've got everything we need. We're going to use this equation 
let's use it on the next page. Change in temperature is equal to K times the molality times I. So plugging everything in, 0 0.512 times the molality, which was 1.5, times the vent Hoff factor, which was 4. So plugging that into the calculator, we get a change in the boiling temperature of 3.126 degrees Celsius. Um, now, one really, really important thing to remember here is we're not done answering the question because the question wanted to know what is the new boiling temperature of the water. The new boiling temperature of the water. This is the change in the boiling temperature of the water. So our boiling temperature is going to go up by this amount. Remember that the original boiling temperature of water with nothing in it is 100 degrees Celsius, and we are going to add in this 3.126 degrees Celsius to get an actual boiling temperature of this solution of 1.3126. That, sorry, 100, man, 100.3126 degrees Celsius. So our boiling temperature of this stuff went up, oh man, and I did that wrong too, wow. I'm having a tough afternoon recording this video. Let's try that again. Simple arithmetic, 103.126 degrees Celsius. There we go. Whew. Okay. Now, one last thing here. If dissolving a solute in a solvent has an effect on the boiling point, it also has an effect on the freezing point. Because when we get those solute particles in there, they interrupt with the bonding process of the water molecules with each other when we lower the temperature to freeze those suckers. So this is called freezing point depression. And depression gives you the idea that instead of going up, the freezing point actually goes down. So here we're going to go as the solution concentration increases, the freezing point or freezing temperature decreases. So if you've got normal water, we have a normal freezing point of zero degrees Celsius. And if we add salt to it, if we add sugar to it, if we add any sort of solute to it, the freezing point for that is going to go down. And luckily for us, the freezing point depression equation is almost identical to the boiling point equation, except we have a K sub F. We still have the molality, and we still have the Van Hoff factor. And we're going to throw a negative out front there to remind us that this is going to go down. The freezing point is going to go down. Um, this molal freezing point constant, K sub F, is equal to 1.86. So the addition of a solute has a bigger effect on the freezing point than it would on the boiling point. The uh, Van Hoff factor is still the same. If it's ionic, you've got to add up the number of ions. If it's molecular, then it's always going to be 1. And again, that little cursive M is our molality. So let's do one quick example of this, and you'll get turned loose. So here we go. The average molality <coughs> of seawater is 0 0.65 moles per kilogram. So then what is the freezing point of seawater? If we're up at the North Pole, Santa Claus's house, how cold do we have to get that water to get it to freeze? It's going to have to be something below 0. Um, so our change in the freezing temperature is equal to negative K sub F times the molality times the Van Hoff factor. All right, so first the Van Hoff factor for NaCl. We've got one sodium, one chloride. It's two, two ions in that ionic compound. So plugging in what we have here, nice thing about this one is we already have the molality, so we don't have to do any extra work on the front end. So using that Van Hoff factor of 1.8, uh, sorry, using the freezing point constant of 1.86, we plug in the molality that was given, 0 0.65, and we plug in the Van Hoff factor, 2. And we end up with a freezing point depression of about 2.418 degrees Celsius lower than zero. So then our actual freezing temperature here is going to be zero minus 2.418. Let's see if I can do my arithmetic better this time. Negative 2.418 degrees Celsius. So getting salt water down to zero, ocean water, seawater, down to zero isn't going to do it. You have to actually get it colder than that. And there it is. So on 
Well, that's it. You're ready to go. I'll talk to you next time.